Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Midweek Introductions. Um, This week, we're looking at Christian beginnings from Nazareth to Nicaea, AD 30 to 325, by Gates of Vermesh. Uh, I think some people have pronounced that uh, Geyser Vermes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure um, which is the correct pronunciation, but we'll go with Vermesh for now. Um, Vermesh was very, very famous for his, uh, I think, translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls, in particular, the Qumran community that produced such a lot of literature in the period uh, immediately before Jesus. There was some speculation that the community at Qumran, who I think are collectively known as the Essenes or the Essenes, um, might have overlapped to some extent with uh, John the Baptist, especially in the practice of baptism, a, uh, a ritual washing away of sins. Anyway, this is the introduction to Vermesh's um, quite quite short book. So it's, it's quite a short introduction, which is useful, as it'll save my voice for Holy Week. More than 40 years have passed since my initial venture into the Jesus field that culminated with Jesus the Jew in 1973. After the publication of 12 further books on the topic, it occurred to me in 2008 to round off the series with a very different book, an attempt to sketch the historical continuity between Jesus portrayed in his Galilean charismatic setting and the first ecumenical council held at Nicaea in AD 325, which solemnly proclaimed his divinity as a dogma of Christianity. In this attempt to tracing the evolutionary curve, particular emphasis will be laid on the impact of charismatic Judaism on Jesus and on budding Palestinian Christianity. Equally important to note is the influence of Hellenistic thought and mysticism on the early church, which within decades from the crucifixion became very largely Greek in speech and thought. The trend started with Paul and the fourth gospel, and was responsible from the second century onwards for the impact of Platonic philosophy on the formulation of Christian theological ideas. The final crucial thrust stemmed from the pressure exerted by the Emperor Constantine on the bishops of the Nicene Council, compelling them to bear in mind the reverberations of their ongoing religious disputes on the civic peace of the Roman state. To grasp the full picture, let us first glance at Judaism. As a religion, it essentially applied to persons born into the Jewish nation. In his turn, Jesus himself also exclusively addressed the Jews and ordered his envoys to turn only to the lost sheep of Israel. However, Judaism also accepted Gentile proselytes who were willing to confess the uniqueness of God and embrace all the religious obligations of the Mosaic law. Ritual initiation was achieved through proselyte baptism, conferred on both male and female candidates, and through the circumcision of all the male aspirants. It goes without saying that a certain amount of missionary activity was pursued among the Gentiles in various periods of Jewish history, including the age of Jesus but how widely it was practiced in those days, and how deeply the eschatological idea of Israel being the light of the nation's penetrated Jewish consciousness continued to be subject to scholarly debate. Admission of Gentiles into the early Judeo-Christian community is originally presumed to have followed conversion to Judaism. The first members of the Jesus movement could hardly have imagined a non-Jew becoming their companion. However, less than 20 years after the crucifixion, the church authorities urged by Paul relented and abolished the condition of prior acceptance of the Mosaic law, including circumcision for converts. The only obliged Gentile candidates for church membership 
to abide by a few basic rules, similar to the Noahic laws, that's Noah, of course, which prohibited idol worship, the consumption of blood, and certain sexual acts abhorrent to Jews. Beneath the essentially law-based Judaism, there existed also a current of less formal religion. It was linked to and fed by the prophets, the influential mouthpieces of God, and was sustained down to the age of the rabbis by charismatic holy men. This religion demanded a devout attitude towards the deity, whose protection was solicited against illness, premature death, injustice and war, as well as for the poor, the widow and the fatherless. Divine goodwill was also sought for a long and happy life and the well-being of the family, and occasionally, in the late biblical period, for the privilege of escaping the underworld in some mysterious way and joining God beyond the grave in some form of afterlife. In the early stages of biblical history, Judaism represented not so much monotheism, the claim that there is only one God, but monolatory, monolatry, which means that, practically ignoring the pantheon of other peoples, the Jews revered only their own God. The Bible contains no rational argument against polytheism, the primitive assertion that the foreign deities are idols made by men out of wood, stone or precious metals hardly rates as an intellectual proof of the non-existence of other divine beings, although it continued to be repeated by both Jews and Christians for centuries. So uh, Vermesh is um, saying, as is you know, fairly evident from the Old Testament, that there is um, an assumption of the existence of other gods. In practice, Jews had to resist the social and political attraction of the religions of their neighbouring peoples, Canaanites, Philistines, and even more so of their Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek and Roman overlords. The worship of foreign gods was seen not so much as an erroneous act as the breach of a mystical monogamous matrimony between the heavenly king and his bride, the chosen people of Israel. Uh, which is probably why um, uh, Hosea, um, perhaps not in uh, concepts we'd find um, particularly acceptable today, has um, a lot of, I suppose, quasi... Um, uh, adulterous um, analogies in terms of the the wayward partner. It was only under the influence of the prophets of the exilic and post-exilic period in the 6th century BC that proper monotheism, the idea of a single God responsible for the creation of the world and humankind, entered Jewish consciousness, together with the conviction that only this God would ultimately be duly recognised by the whole human race. Monotheism remained the battle cry of the Jews, whereas Christians were subjected to criticism by both Jews and pagans for falsely claiming to be monotheists, I guess probably because of the Trinity. Regarding the nature of the Jewish religion, one point is definitely beyond dispute. Intellectual religious speculation as such played no part in Hebrew or Aramaic Jewish literature written in the Second Temple period after the Babylonian exile, or in the later centuries of Midrash, Mishnah and Talmud. The works of Philo and Josephus' Against Apion form the main exceptions in this field of antiquity. They were, however, composing Greek in either for Gentile readers or for Jews imbued with Hellenism. Jews produced no theological treatise in a Semitic language before the 10th century AD, with the one possible exception of the 1st century BC, instruction on the two spirits incorporated into the Cave One manuscript of the Qumran community rule, that's from the Dead Sea Scrolls, in which the divine purpose of creation and the destiny of humankind 
uh, mankind are summarily expounded. Well, I do think that's a very important point because it's so easy as Christians and perhaps the um, evangelical end of the spectrum is particularly guilty of this. It's so easy to make sweeping statements assuming that the Bible contains a sort of theological rebuttal of, um, or at least defence of, a Judeo-Christian monotheism. But as Vermesh is saying, that the Bible is just not that kind of text. Judaism was primarily a religion of deeds. Apart from subscribing to a single doctrinal proposal concerning the oneness of God, it essentially amounted to a way of life. In the temple or the synagogue, at home or in the workplace, religion was enacted through obedience to rules, believed to have been laid down by the deity. These rules, above all the law of Moses, were handed down and interpreted by the caste of the Levitical priests, who were considered the divinely appointed guardians of justice and piety. Their monopoly remained uncontested until the 2nd century BC, when lay evangelicals, the Pharisees, whose authority stemmed from their leading, uh, learning, rather, began to challenge them. The leadership of the Pharisees was to be taken over by their heirs, the rabbis, after the destruction of the temple. So, as much as the Pharisees in the Gospels are like, boo, hiss, the Pharisees, um, actually, their role, especially immediately prior to Jesus, was probably a quite profoundly liberating one. The religion of Jesus was essentially an appeal for eschatological action, but, and then that's sort of um, get your act together, something really important is happening. But subsequent Christianity, although it also insisted on deeds and for a time remained eschatological, so concerned with the, the end times, the conclusion of history, was turned by Paul and John into a religion of believing. So although it's the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, which give us the real narrative meat of Christianity, uh, the real substance, so to speak, uh, it's Paul in his letters and then John, who's probably towards the end of the first century, who really starts to turn that, I suppose, very um, Jewish, very Palestinian-rooted um way of life framed in a um, radical context that urgent um, motivation to uh, repent, to turn to God that I guess has its roots in John the Baptist. It's only through Paul and John that this has turned, according to Vermesh, as he puts it, into a religion of believing. Notwithstanding its Jewish roots, it developed into a fundamentally distinct movement, which had already become creed-based with Ignatius of Antioch from the start of the 2nd century AD. So, you know, the time scale on this is very short. We go from Paul, let's say Jesus dies in around uh, AD 30, you get, um, I, th I think... Um, Jesus seems to have been about 33 when he died, but the um, the calendar, the synchronicity is off a little bit. I think it's thought that Herod the Great died in 4 BC, so your 33 years are probably somewhere around the, the pre-4 BC mark through to uh, around about AD 30. But anyway, um, Jesus lives in, you know, the start of that period, um, hence AD, Anno Domini, and um, then we get Paul writing in the 50s, uh, fall of Jerusalem in about the 70s, uh, it was, sorry, in, in AD 70 specifically. Um, it's possible that Mark's Gospel is a smidge before that, um, Matthew perhaps afterwards, Luke a little bit later, and then John, um, either potentially um, before Luke, if you see Luke's Gospel, as wrapping everything up, or um, at the very end, really, of the first century. 
And, and that's why John's Gospel is, is so different, because, again, it's a different kind of text. And then the first creedal statement from Ignatius of Antioch um, in the, the early 100s. Uh, he says uh, it then took a philosophical turn with Justin in the mid second century. I remember doing Justin, I think, in patristics. Um, so within about hundreds, maybe 50 years, you have what goes from uh, a revolutionary movement with John the Baptist and Jesus within Judaism, where you see the roots of their thought very much in the uh, the, the interior of Judaism, so to speak, through Paul and uh, John, who are more Hellenistic thinkers, more, more Greek thinkers, through to what we start to see as uh, an emerging doctrinal Christianity with Ignatius of Antioch and also with uh, Justin. The features dominating Christianity were belief concerning the nature of the deity, the definition of Jesus Christ's person, uh, his humanity, divinity, and of his work of salvation, and the redemptive function of the one true church. On authentic faith depended whether someone was within the church or outside it, and really you see that following through to uh, the Reformation and the, the splits therein. Personal conduct in the religious domain came second to belief. Repentance, though early Christian rigorous, allowed it only once after baptism, healed sin. And through penance, every wrong could be put right as long as faith persisted. Compared to Judaism, Christianity's cosmopolitan character constituted the second essential difference. Now, this will be a really interesting point. Within decades after the crucifixion, the church turned away from the Jewish temple. And soon after AD 70, Christian supersessionism began, founded on the view that the destruction of Jerusalem and its sanctuary proved the rejection of Judaism by God and its replacement by a new people of God. Uh, the, the earliest Christians uh, met in, in their houses, and uh, and also um, met in synagogues. You see lots of that in the Acts of the Apostles. But there seems to have been a gradual um, break with the, the synagogue. And I think Vermesh is saying that the more they got um, pushed out, the more that meant that when the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem fell to the Romans um, in AD 70, they saw that as a vindication, a justification of their position. Now, obviously, Palestine was already occupied by Rome, but there was a, uh, a revolt in, in that period, and the, um, the temple was destroyed, I think, by Titus, um, just before he became emperor. Also, by the end of the first century, increasing Jewish unresponsiveness to the preaching of the apostles and ministries brought about an ever-increasing Hellenistic Gentile takeover of the Jesus movement. And so, quite frankly, Christianity was uh, successful in the, the, uh, the, the wider world, uh, particularly the Roman Empire. And that Roman Empire, despite being obviously Roman, was saturated with Greek thought. They were preoccupied with the role of Christ in the salvation of mankind, his superterrestrial pre-existence entailing divine generation prior to time, and his instrument instrumentality in the creation of the cosmos before history began. I and mean, obviously it's a huge jump to go from Jesus' moral teaching within the context of the end times to Jesus as a pre-existent, godly figure, um, active in creation. The way of thinking of the Church Fathers was very different from that of Jesus. The principal task the prophet from Nazareth set in front of his Galilean followers was the pursuit of the Kingdom of God in the immediacy of the here and now. By the 4th century 
the practical, charismatic Judaism preached by Jesus was transformed into an intellectual religion defined and regulated by dogma. This book is meant to guide readers along the evolutionary path from the Jesus of history towards the Christ deified at the Council of Nicaea. Wow, what a good introduction. Uh, Vermesh is a really, really great writer. I remember when I was an undergraduate reading, um, I think it's one of the few bits of extracurricular reading I did, um, but reading, uh, in addition to our um, our set reading list, uh, Vermesh's autobiography, um, which is well worth a read. Um, I think there are quite significant implications of even just that introduction and the sort of historical realism that we find in that introduction is something which I think, uh, again, because of my undergraduate background in theology, has informed some of my, I wouldn't say scepticism, but some of my caveats, some of my reservations when it comes to expressing my own faith. Perhaps one or two uh, concluding comments. What Vermesh is absolutely underlying is the fact that the the Jesus that we uh, worship, the Jesus that is central to our understanding of the world, I guess, uh, is a Jesus who was constructed, a Jesus who was constructed by Paul, by John, by Ignatius, by Justin, and right through to the um, Council of Nicaea in 325, which is where we get, obviously, our Nicene Creed from, that uh, theological slash philosophical way of seeing Jesus, way of interpreting his life, um, becomes that construct becomes formalised in a statement of belief. It's quite interesting that I think there are lots of people even that go to church who find the creeds quite difficult, who uh, stand up for the Nicene Creed somewhat with their their fingers crossed behind their backs. And I think the more our society has become, I guess, post-Enlightenment, scientific, um, not just modernist, but postmodernist, the more we find it uh, challenging to uh, assent to those statements. And, you know, of course, assent is uh, is a kind of communal activity. It's not necessarily saying we believe in each one of these blow by blow, but the we, we hold faith with the tradition in which these statements evolved. But I think Vermesh is absolutely right to draw our attention to the, if not the disconnect, at least the the massive uh, gap in terms of hermeneutics, in terms of interpretation. The Jesus that we would have encountered in the first century is not the Jesus who is uh, enshrined in the Nicene Creed. So what do we do with that? Well, attempts to recover the real Jesus, so to speak, are notoriously as I mentioned before, prone to projection. We look for the the ideal Jesus who conforms to our own moral code. I think, therefore, rather than claiming that we can get right back to Jesus and perhaps simply be good people by following his teaching, that we can declutter Christianity of centuries of theological thought, we just need to take it as a, a caution and I think as a prompt to acknowledge within our own thinking, within our own faith, the different strands and influences involved. So I guess my, my recommendation of Vermesh's way of thinking, of his analysis, of his critique, uh, is not to say, boo Paul and John, boo all the patristic thinkers, they turned a, a radical Jewish, moral, charismatic thinker into a sort of fossilised religious product. I think it's to say that just be a little bit cautious 
the 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 essence of the the argument from my point of view i think is that jesus had this uh, amazing influential world changing outlook and ministry and then centuries of thought interpreted that and ultimately that's what we do with faith we interpret and it's for each of us to make that act of interpretation and that i think is ultimately why uh, an objective view of religious faith is uh, false. Uh, adhering to creedal statements too strictly is uh, ultimately short-sighted. What we have in common is that subjectivity, is that interpretation. Nonetheless, though, I think we can say that that subjectivity is rooted in a real person, in a real ministry, in a real and revolutionary outlook. Um, so, I think of all the introductions I've read so far, uh, this is uh, probably the book that I'd most like to return to and finish. Um, I hope everyone's doing all right. I'd be interested to know what you've been reading. If you'd like to um, drop me an email, please do.